Um, but I do. Oh, thank you for reminding that, me of that. Um, uh, we don't have our GitHub data, but over the past couple of months, our number of open issues and open PRs are growing substantially. Um, so, uh, by the way, it's been a little bit more than a year now that we've been on GitHub. And I think overall things have um, been really smooth. We've had uh, a lot more um, contributions, I think, over the past year, at least more new people coming in, which is really exciting. Um, but the issues are growing and PRs are growing. So um, I would strongly encourage people um, to take a look at the issues and respond and take a look at the um, PRs and try to give reviews um, when you can. Okay. So a quick agenda for today's meeting. Um, so as a reminder, we post about this on uh, the discussions um, and the agenda can be found on the, this discussion on page 1503. Um, and then, uh, so today, oh, I guess one other thing I wanted to say before diving in is, um, you know, kind of the purpose of these dev meetings is uh, to try to communicate um, within the community. I think that's something that I want to try to get better about is communicating the reasons that we're pushing things here at Davis. You know, we have a big team <clears throat> and we do a lot of work and I think that we could do a better job communicating why we're doing what we're doing and uh, kind of letting the community know where things are going um, from our side. And so I wanna use these dev meetings to improve the communication um, over what we've done in the past. So to that end, that's what a lot of this agenda is. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about deprecating things, um, talk a little bit about what demo boards are, and then, um, Mayar is going to present some of his findings about um, performance disparities between Gym 5 and hardware. And if anybody else has anything at the end of the meeting, um, they, there should be time for that. Okay, so first thing I want to talk about is uh, demo boards. So um, as many of you know, we have uh, we've been doing a lot of work here at Davis on the Gym 5 standard library. And the whole point behind, behind the standard library is to make things easier, it, make it easier to use Gem5 and to make it more, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Consistent, the way people use Gem5. Um, and with the goal of generally making our science better. So the whole point of Gem5 is to encourage or, or, or to enable computer architectural research. And so we want to, encourage good science. We want to make it reproducible. We want to make it um, accurate. We want to make it um, explainable, these kinds of things. So the way the demo boards fit into this is in the standard library, we have the idea of pre-built boards. Um, and these pre-built boards, the long-term goal is to have um, what we've been referring to as known good configurations. So essentially, we want to have a board in the standard library, which we know is um, some percentage of accuracy against a piece of hardware. I don't think we're gonna ever have it be perfectly accurate. I don't think that's a reasonable goal, um, but what I want it to be is known. So there's a known accuracy against some piece of hardware. Um, this is really hard. Um, I'm sure anybody who's tried to do this uh, will know that it's incredibly difficult to do um, and it's taking it takes a huge amount of time. Uh, our group, our research group has been working on that um, here, but we have a ways to go. Mayara will actually talk some about this um, in a few minutes. So in the meantime, before we have any actually accurate boards, we want to develop all of the infrastructure that's necessary to do this accuracy testing and to do the communication of how accurate these boards are. So that's where the demo boards come in. So um, as the next bullet point here is talking about what the pre-built pre boards are not. So the point of these boards is not to be configurable. 
or parameterized or extensible. The point is that these boards are like a system that you would buy from Dell. You don't have a way to configure that system, um, at least not after you buy it. And so that's what these pre-built boards are uh, meant to be. And, and they're really, the, the goal of having this fixed thing is so we have a fixed target that we can explain to the community, uh, the wider community, um, what this fixed target is. So as I said, we're not gonna be able to do this against real hardware in the very short term, but we are hoping to do it soon. And so the demo boards are meant to be something that we can use to develop the infrastructure for all these other things. So the goal here is to use the um, demo boards to kind of show that the workloads and the suites that we're developing run functionally correctly, get timing results that are um, reasonable, as in like functionally reasonable, not necessarily accurate in any way, and to build this infrastructure. So let me show you what I'm hoping that we'll have soon. So this is a screenshot from Gem5 Resources, the Gem5 Resources webpage. So we have this workload, which is um, from the NAS parallel benchmarks in PB. One of the workloads is called BT, um, and it has different sizes. In this case, we're doing size B. Um, and this is running on ARM with Ubuntu 24.04. So this is a particular workload. And what I want to show on this, um, apology for the poor handwriting, I just sketched this before the meeting. Um, what I want to show on this web page is a new tab that shows what the status of this workload is on our pre-built boards that are compatible with the workload. So for instance, the ARM demo board, which is something we're trying to push right now. I want to show that it takes 17 hours to run this workload. This way, people will know if they're trying to run the workload on a board that looks like the ARM demo board or on the ARM, ARM demo board itself, that if it's taking a week, there's probably something wrong. Or if it finishes in 10 minutes, there's probably something wrong. I want to show like the amount of time that is predicted to take in the simulator. So I made this up at 0.8 seconds and then the number of instructions. And we could also do some other stats too, like L1 misses, IPC, et cetera. We can show some uh, high level stats here. Um, and so this is, again, like why I want these demo boards is so we can start doing developing the infrastructure to do these kinds of things. Um, and then with this, I think we can do some other really cool things. So this discussion link here, 754, um, discusses what we're calling GEM5, or maybe just Jeff. I can't remember exactly what the acronym is. Um, but the idea is to make it easier to run these workloads and make it more um, reproducible. And then we can other do, do some other really cool things. If for the workload we know about how many instructions it executes, um, we could develop a dashboard while the workload is running to say how long it's going to take to finish. Um, so we can kind of predict the time that it's going to take and see what percentage you are through it. Um, and this really allows you to know quickly if something is broken or not working. Um, this will also allow us a way to communicate to the community what's been tested in terms of real load, well, real workloads and what's not been tested. Um, and then you can also come in and see, is the ARM de demo board, like, does it make sense to take 0.8 seconds for this workload or not? And you can kind of decide, is this board a reasonable baseline for the research that I want to do. So that's kind of the thoughts. Um, I know, Giacomo, you kind of had a question on what the purpose of the uh, demo boards are. Does this um, help explain it? Yep, definitely. Yeah, sorry, I saw the PR and there was no uh, comment on the PR. So uh, I just wondered what was the difference. Uh, I think that explains that. Yeah. It, the difference with the other uh, ARM board in the standard library, I mean. Right. Um, any other questions or thoughts about uh, these demo boards or generally so, so some of the things that we are thinking about developing over the next um, few months? Yeah, I, I think I actually have like uh, several questions. So the first one is, um, uh, would we run daily tests on the board or like on a per commit base, how would that sort of work? Yeah, that's a great question. 
my thought is we would run this only on stable. Um, okay. And so this would happen once per release cycle because most of these um, tests that we're looking at, well, I don't know, it, yeah, Aaron's here. A A Aaron, um, can, can you talk a little bit about how long things have been running as you're trying to run some of these tests? Uh, yeah, um, I've been running some of the NPB size B workloads and they've been taking like two weeks or so um, and they only get like partway through and then um, we had to reboot some of the machines recently. So I don't know how long they would actually take to finish. Yeah, and I think we're talking like how many different configurate like runs are you running, Aaron? Did, did you ever calculate the number of things that we need to, to test? Um, so for one ISA and one size, there's nine. Uh, so if we do x86 and ARM, then we would have to run like 18 size B workloads. Yeah, and that's just for NPB. And I think we have a goal of doing at least two or three different suites and at least two or three different sizes out of each of those suites across two or three different ISAs gives us hundreds, if not order thousand runs to do, all of them taking on the order of um, days to weeks means that, yeah. So to answer your question, Giacomo, directly, it's not going to run daily. <laughs> it's going to run once every few months if we're lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that that, uh, that makes sense. And um, I guess like, yeah, because I had like a follow-up question on how we would actually up update it. But then like if you're updating daily, then you need to update the website. Whereas if you're like just using it on stable, then uh, I think you can advertise the cost and just, uh, yeah, update once every six months or whenever you have like a new release. Um, so a, a comment I would like to make with respect to that is that, I mean, first of all, I think it's a, it's a very good effort on making things clear um, for the user on sort of what to expect on a particular workload. When it comes about having like a sort of fixed model, I would say um, would also need to take into consideration the fact that the Mac architecture that um, we are modeling, of course, is tightly coupled with the architecture, which is constantly under, under development. So even if you get, basically get like a sort of fixed target at a specific time, then, and basically we don't change um, the platform, will still uh, need to be careful on introducing and might potentially have like some inaccuracies, some uh, convergence to the real hardware or some divergence to the real hardware, the moment um, we actually uh, develop or back fix some uh, um, architectural uh, uh, features, uh, <clears throat> making use of uh, other, for example, vectorized instruction uh, with respect to another. Um, so that's one note and similarly, um, one thing that I wanted to mention at a certain point, because I presume that most of this workload is basically based on um, shipping the binary within a disk image and booting Linux and then executing the benchmark, um, it also depends on how the kernel is actually configured, so on the kernel config. And I haven't seen it, so, so it might be my problem, but one thing I would recommend is um, together with the kernel, maybe we should also provide like a sort of config file um, so that it's clearer for a user and also for us, um, which particular uh, feature are actually enabled or disabled um, on a kernel side, because maybe we are actually not using everything we actually wanted to use. Um, so, so my point Yeah, is... so those are all really good points. Um, let, let, let me uh, kind of restate them a little bit. Um, uh, sorry, as a as an aside, I'm going to come back to this meeting and take some of these notes. Um, this is really helpful, Giacomo. Um, so on the, I think you're absolutely right. There's a bunch of caveats to this, and we will have to be really careful to enumerate the caveats of the data that we're sharing, um, and make sure that people understand what they can learn from it and what they can't learn from the data. 
I, I think that's a really, really good point. And also uh, like, sorry. No, go ahead. No, sorry. Uh, and also like, um, I think making it explicit that um, we are not basically guaranteeing that it will basically match real hardware um, and make sure it's just like a best effort on trying to mimic like a sort of specific arm-like board and uh, just making sure we are not over-promising um, something that we actually can deliver. Right. I think, yeah, that, that, that's super important. Um, and also one of the things about the demo boards that I kind of like is that we're not even trying. <laughs> and so that's really explicit. I think if you use them, it pops up and it says, do not use this for research. Um, yeah, so, so that's one uh, really good point. And the other point that you make is also great as well about the kernel configurations and everything. Um, so two, two points on that, that, that uh, one is one that we have not communicated well um, and the other is something else. So, so what we haven't communicated very well is we are trying really hard to extract the kernel that comes from Ubuntu. So we figured out how to do this on x86, but we haven't figured out how to do it on ARM and RISC-V yet. Um, but this way, when you we're doing just a vanilla Ubuntu install and then extracting the kernel and using that kernel, that way we know like it would match what someone is installing on their Dell system, for instance, if they installed 2404, at least at a particular time. So we're trying to do that. Um, so if anyone knows how to extract the kernel off of an ARM Ubuntu install, we would love to hear it. Um, we could probably figure out how to build it separately, but we haven't built, been able to figure out how to extract it. Now, Herschel, do you know exactly why you couldn't extract it? Um, so for x86, we just use the extract VM Linux that Ubuntu provides, but that doesn't extract the kernel for ARM in the correct format. So it will give you a file, but you can't run it in gem file. Like it just doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what we've tried. And then the other point about, um, uh, and, and that isn't perfect, right? Because that kernel is a very generic kernel. It may, may or may not have all the configuration parameters that you want. Um, you know, I think vector support is a really good example of that, Giacomo. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing is there are some kernel configs on um, Gem5 resources. Um, I think that the kernels that we provide that are pre-built have configs that are committed, but I'm not actually certain on that. They should, um, but it's probably not documented very well. So we will be sure to work on that. Oh, right. And the other thing I wanted to bring up was um, I would love to work with you more um, or others at ARM and um, generally others that are more knowledgeable than I am about this as to what the right configurations are for different systems. Um, like what a good baseline would be for us to be building off of. Because I think that, you know, things are getting more stable. We have some of these um, better, we have some better infrastructure in place for workloads and stuff now than we have in the past. And so I think it's time that we can really sit down and figure out what the right things to do are um, so we can get some good baselines um, for these workloads and for boards. So. Uh, I'd love to work with you, Giacomo, to try to figure out some of those things. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you say configuration, you mean like um, sort of um, um, hardware organization? Um... Well, I mean, at everything. So so like the, um, I think the the biggest things that we can't figure out easily ourselves is, um, uh, things like what the, so kernel configurations is something that's difficult to come by. And then like ARM platform configurations. So what um, what platform it's using, what the release configuration is, what hardware should be there, um, those kinds of things. You know, some of the other configuration like sizes of caches and stuff are generally available. Right. I mean, from like a sort of CPU point of view, like, if your team is basically focusing on um, correlating over a specific uh, hardware, that basically gives you part 
of an answer, right? Because then like, you know, considering a specific CPU, which is the architectural release uh, the CPU is actually targeting. And then like, you can configure Gem5 accordingly, making sure like um, all extensions are enabled and we don't enable extensions that uh, are not actually supported by uh, by the hardware you're modeling against. Um, it's like a sort of partial things. And then there are some other details that uh, like Mac architectural details that um, we cannot really share. Yeah, I definitely don't think that um, we would be asking for micro architectural details, but uh, having some outside eyes that like to do a review of does the platform look reasonable? Is the kernel configuration reasonable? Um, have we set the right compiler flags? These kinds of things I think would be important for um, increasing the um, community's trust in these things that we're um, trying to um, create. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Cool. Um, any other questions or comments on these demo boards or the vision for workloads and where we're going? Okay, cool. Um, so next, um, hopefully this is pretty quick, this discussion, the, the next two discussion points. Um, so this pull request 1498 was deprecating configs common. I think that the pull request itself was um, not, not meant to be serious. It was kind of a point to start some discussion. Um, so first, let me do a bit of a rant. Uh, and I know people have heard this from me many, many times, but the interface to Gem5 is not command line parameters and it should not be command line parameters. The interface to Gem5 is Python configuration scripts. Um, we should be encouraging our users to write Python code, not give 47 line bash scripts um, of parameters. So the standard library is trying to help with this um, and it's not perfect. I'll be the first to admit that. Um, I think it really does not do a good job with discoverability of what the parameters are. It doesn't do a very good job of what the discoverability of what the options for the parameters are. And it does not do a very good job of um, making an interface such that you can easily, easily change parameters. Totally agree. We should think about ways to try to do that. Um, but I think that the se.py approach and the common options.py approach of trying to present every possible parameter on the command line is very dangerous for research. Um, so why do we want to deprecate this? Um, it's a maintenance nightmare. Um, and options.py specifically is incredibly mi misleading, right? You can set minus minus L3 cache associativity on the command line, but you might not even have an L3 cache in your system, depending on uh, uh, other command line parameters. And so it's really misleading. And I have seen in, I don't know about published work, but I've definitely seen in things that my students have done that they've done things wrong. And I, I think I'm more likely to catch these things than others. And the other reason why we should deprecate it is that while it's there, people will keep using it. There are still patches coming in on a weekly basis that are using arguments in common or adding new arguments to common. And this is just making the problem worse and worse. So that's my reasons for why we want to do this. Um, but there are some blockers um, to doing it. The ARM full system tests are one. Um, the ARM examples scripts are another blocker. Um, and then the GPU scripts are probably the biggest or are, are, are another blocker. Um, so I'm going to talk about each of these blockers um, one at a time and how we might be able to get around it. But before I do that, any questions or comments? Anyone want to argue with me about um, deprecation? 
I think uh, I have some comments, but I guess we can discuss once we go through the blocker list. Okay. So like, I don't know if you want me to start, like I understand like the RMFS ad. Um, yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there is really no reason why the RMFS test should have command line parameters because they're just tests. And yep. I didn't look into specifically, but I believe the thing that probably, the reason why they actually use config common, it's more to look into course ARM and the O3 model that is mentioned there in config example ARM. And, um, that just like um, that config file, there's nothing wrong with that config file. It just has the misfortune of being placed under the configs common. So when we say like config common is bad, maybe we should say options.py is bad and maybe some other files because that file is actually fine. So we, sh we should just uh, move it somewhere else and then we basically remove uh, some of the blockers. Um, so also, so not only I believe FS test mainly relies on config on core arms, and if there is some remaining things, yeah, I'm, I agree we should change them. But for example, the config example arm, I'm fairly sure that most of them, with the notable exception of the Ruby FS script, because it's Ruby and it requires some Ruby options as another um, problem. But most of them, and I talk like FS big little and starter FS, starter SE, they're actually fine script and they don't use options.py um, and they are a restricted set of options. Um, and I think it's a reasonable way of uh, configuring the system. Um, it's different than the standard library um, in the sense that um, it can be like less user-friendly in a way uh, because um, it's, le it's less like um, yeah, you need to provide some command line parameters still, uh, but I think it's still reasonable. And for me, it's like my go-to choice in case I actually wanted to tweak some parameters. I have the suspicion from my uh, look is that those uh, configs, example, ARM scripts are actually more configurable. So yeah, bottom line, I believe that with those cases, um, I don't think um, they are tightly coupled with options.py. And most of the dependencies probably with the um, O3 ARM V7A or HPI files, which have nothing wrong in them. I agree with everything you're saying, Giacomo. Um, so I think that the, the steps would be to update the RMFS tests to not have parameters, which I think most of them have been updated, but th there might be a few that haven't. Um, and then to move the cores directory out of common um, or somehow the whole configs directory is actually a big, big mess. Um, and so, yeah, we, we could think about how, how to move that. Um, I agree with uh, leaving starter FS and starter SE and um, HPI alone, that makes sense. Um, I think long-term, it would be nice to kind of convert those to use the standard library so that we um, are a little bit more consistent, but that is much more long-term. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And actually, um, because I spent some time there, I know that, uh, sorry, there is an ambulance passing. Um, so I know that uh, a part of uh, that directory over there that I would honestly change is the way we actually configure the cache hierarchy, uh, which is not particularly neat from a software engineering point of view. So some time ago, I actually tried to do mix and match and to basically try to use uh, the standard library cache hierarchy from um, starter FS, uh, for example. And the issue is that you cannot do that because um, it requires you to actually embrace the ARM board and to use the ARM board uh, because it it's a requirement. So I would honestly love to cherry pick some parts of the and to reuse some part of the standard library. The issue is, it seemed to me that either you commit to everything and you just become a full standard library or you cannot actually do that. Yeah, that's a great point. Um... And you said this was for the full system, uh, uh, starter FS? 
yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's um, it, it. The standard library doesn't have the best um, abstractions for the all of the I.O. stuff that needs to be done um, for full system. It, it was really hard to figure out what should go in the board and what should go in the cache hierarchy. You know, like in some sense, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to put the I.O. crossbar in the cache hierarchy. Um, that seems like something that's board level, but it does make it where you can't then easily use the cache hierarchy um, for, or can't use the cache hierarchy outside the ARM board because the ARM board has a bunch of pieces of the cache hierarchy that are required for a full system. Um, yeah, so if you have ideas on how to improve that, uh, I think we're all ears. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. Uh, I think like it's true what you're saying about full system, but I believe it also applies to SQL emulation. Um, because um, the issue I was having is just that the cache hierarchy class was relying on the, having an ARM board, regardless of the IO crossbar. So it's not, I, 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 I tried doing this for starter FS, but I suspect I would encounter similar issues with um, uh, starter SE, for example. And uh, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I think. I, SE mode would be, I think we could figure it out for SE mode. I, I, the interfaces might not be there, but I, I think there's a path. That's a good point. Um, we will put this in the long list of things we would love to work on, but probably aren't going to have the time in, in the near future. Um, but this is a really, really good idea for a new feature. Thanks. Um, the other big problem, and unfortunately, none of the GPU people are here, so I guess we're going to have to skip this discussion. The, the other big difficulty is um, the GPU scripts, which are not easy to port outside of options.py. Um, so with neither Matt Sinclair nor Matt Perimba here, I'm not sure we can really discuss this. Um, so I guess we'll just skip that. Um, so the other, oh, sorry, Giacomo, did you have something to say? Um, sorry, another ambulance. <laughs> um, so one solution that I actually used in another script to not use options.py was basically to grab on a file. I don't know how complex it is, the APU file, but basically check every option uh, that was actually used and imported. Uh, sorry, was actually using the script and basically extracted from options.py and uh, basically just copy paste it in a script. Um, you're not solving much because you still have lots of command line parameters, but at least you have decoupled it from options.py and you can basically remove it. So you know you're not, um, you're removing all the other optional ones that would never be used and uh, and you can start decoupling things in this way and it shouldn't take long. But again, I don't know the complexity of, on the... Uh, yeah, on the yeah that, that's a great point. Uh, I, I'm trying to hold my tongue. Uh, I, I hold as much as I can. APU se.py is extraordinarily complicated. Um, it has... It's the most spaghetti code I've ever seen. Um, and trying to figure out what options it uses is not straightforward. But it's a, I appreciate the idea, Giacomo. Uh, okay. Uh, so the other thing I want to talk about deprecating is change ID. Um, we've had this PR 1486 up for a couple of weeks, I think. No one has reviewed it. Does anybody have any blockers to removing the requirement of change IDs? Okay, given that, we're going to merge this change today. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, the last thing, and uh, Mayer, you only have 20 minutes, so go quickly, um, is talking about these paired memory ops. So a little bit of background real fast. Um, so Mayar, along with others in our group, has been working to develop a known good configuration um, for the Ampere Ultra. 
Um, why Ampere Ultra? Because that's what we own. Um, and it's, yeah, that's what we own. Um, if you're interested to see where we are in this progress uh, process, um, this GitHub repo darker Novoverse is where we're working on this. It actually has a lot of different things um, in this repo, but one of them is uh, working on this Ampere Ultra. So just a real quick overview of what Meyer is going to talk about. Um, basically, what we've seen is a significant discrepancy in the hardware counters of the number of cache accesses and the number of stores between what the hardware says is happening and what Gen 5 sees. When we see this discrepancy, we're also seeing a big discrepancy in performance as well. And it seems that the paired memory instructions is what the cause of this discrepancy is. At least that's what our, we don't have direct evidence of it. We have one indirect evidence of it. And Maiar will talk about this. So I'll turn it over to you, Maiar. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to use your presentation or yeah. should I? Okay. So hi, I'm Maiar. I'm a PhD working with Jason. I've been working on trying to come up with a model of the HPC, ARM-based HPC platform that we have in our Ampere Ultra mm, hardware. Um, so Jason, can you go to the next slide? So this is what our model kind of looks like um, in Gen 5. So what we have done is we found uh, a developer had a N1 core configuration in, in their GitHub called they were, their name was Bind Rank. We basically ported that into standard library so that like whatever they have is now like written in standard library. I basically also took like the uh, some inspiration from whatever ARM has already pushed to the config library for the chai configuration, data sheets, and like my understanding of the CMN uh, network on chip and I configured a standard library component that um, almost models a CMN 600, I think. So the main aspects are like the, the, the topology is a mesh network. There are home bases uh, and SLCs are like home bases for certain addresses. Um, the sizing of the caches match what we have found on wiki chips. Um, and the like basically whatever we could find it from data sheets we have put in gem five. And as part of our methodology, we have come up with a way that we can take samples of execution in workloads and we're using Nash parallel benchmarks uh, to do this. Uh, and like take those samples and run them on gem five and on real hardware and also like, get statistics that correlate to that sample specifically. And that's, this is like a parallel ongoing research. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that today, but the high level idea is that we have like very short uh, pieces of execution that we can really focus on, like look at the stream of instructions, like the commit trace and stuff like that, so that we can narrow down the scope of what we're looking at. So if you go to the next slide, Jason, please. So what we see is that over all these samples that we have gathered, Gem5 is between 1.6 times faster to 6.6 .6 times slower. So there's a very wide range of operation and a lot of discrepancy between what happens on Gem5 and real hardware. Uh, apart from that, we've seen that, again, like the, when it comes to the number of accesses to the data cache, Gem5 can be very accurate, like almost exactly the same number of accesses to the data cache to a point where it accesses the data cache 1.6 more time. Another thing that we've seen is also that uh, when it comes to the number of store instructions committed, like this is basically the, the description of the stat in Gen 5. Gen 5 can be between 1x to 4x of real hardware. So what we're measuring on Gen 5 is the number of micro ops committed in gem five. And like in these slides, we're gonna to refer to that as store gem five. And on Pappy, we're using this event called Pappy store instructions. Uh, I think Giacomo, you also mentioned this, that it, this could be micro op, macro ops and not micro ops, uh, but we're gonna just label this as store native and we're gonna use some statistical lit-ish 
methods to see whether there's some correlation or not. And then also we what we see is again with this with the same caveats, there is a one x to one point five x difference between the number of load instructions committed in Gen five compared to real hardware. What we also see from like the data that we have gathered is that error in the number of cycles is highly correlated with the error in data cache accesses, which kind of makes sense. So if we have more accesses going to the cache, we're kind of polluting the, the bandwidth to the cache, uh, we're putting more pressure on the cache, and then the cache becomes a more important piece of the hardware. Well, in Gen 5 than it is in real hardware. Uh, and what also we, we saw is that like, a lot of the error in the number of cache accesses is explainable by the, the error in number of loads and stores. Um, so can you go to the next slide, please? So what you see here, oh, my boxes don't show correctly here. But what you see here is the histogram of the distribution um, of basically explainability. So the x-axis is basically for different samples of execution is uh, basically a portion of error in decache accesses that are not explained by uh, error in memory instructions. So basically you can assume this is a fraction. Uh, on top you have the error in decache accesses and you subtract the error in uh, load instructions and store instructions. So ideally if everything every error in decache access was caused by load, like extra load and store instructions, like extra access is caused by load and store instructions, like everything should be zero. Uh, and then we, uh, but that's not the case, but we can still see that the majority of our samples show that actually it is the case, right? So we have cases that um, there are errors that are not completely explained, but uh, you can see around like, probably uh, out of all of our samples, like 200 of them actually sit around um, basically zero. And it's, that is a scenario where every extra access to the decache is explained by having to execute more load or store instructions. Um, um, sorry, do you mind if I interrupt you or? No, 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 not at all, please. Right. Yeah, no, so the point of my comment in, in GitHub was basically a matter of comparison. So you're basically comparing uh, um, Gen 5 microops and you basically gather this, them from statistics. But microops um, su are supposed to be um, uh, software invisible. So the problem is not on the Gen 5 side. Like you're comparing microops and you need to be careful on what you're comparing on your other framework, like in real hardware. So are you sure that the metric you're actually getting is just the architectural instruction and not the number of uh, of microops? Because that will explain why you have more stores in Gen 5, because you're comparing a microop with, a, with an instruction. With a macro op, yeah. With a macro op, basically. Um, and you would also tell you why the number of decache access um, is uh, not that different. Um, no, because... no, that, that, no. no that, that, that's a misinterpretation. We're saying that the number of decache accesses is different. Why is um, the number of decache accesses different? It's because of the difference in load and store instructions. Um, yeah. So. Uh, okay. But sorry, but yeah, it still remains the the previous point, which is like, what happens if you compare rather than microps? If you start comparing number of instructions, number number yeah. of like load and store instructions. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand your point. Uh, so Jason, if you go to the slide before this, I think where we I compare the number of data there. Yeah, so this plot here compares the number of data cache accesses, right? So regardless of whether we're comparing micro ops or macro ops, we have a difference in like number of D cache accesses. Um, does that make sense so far? Like looking at this plot? Yep, makes sense. So uh, I'm going to try to not use microps and macroops. Uh, well, what I'm seeing is that, like, yeah, so number of instructions that we have uh, is the same. So like the ISA instructions that are actually executed. 
But some, like my hypothesis is that some of these instructions result in more accesses to the cache on Gen5 compared to the real hardware, right? So an incarnation of that is like how a macro off could be translated to micro offs in Gen5. Does that make sense so far? Giacomo? Yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. So if we go to the slide before, like the distribution thing, like basically I'm trying to say, okay, I don't know whether like hardware is showing me macro ops or micro ops. Uh, I'm guessing, but what I'm saying is that whatever I measure and compare is highly correlated with the error in the number of decash accesses. And I agree with you, like I, I'm not trying to argue on that point. But Does how that is that? Correlated? Yeah, no, makes sense. But because you're running on different machines, like uh, you're running on different machines, so it is actually possible that you're executing more instruction in one case and the other. I'm not saying that's the cause. So it could be that um, for some timing reasons or whatever, like you're running on a parallel benchmark, I don't know, it could be that you're actually executing more instruction in one case or the other. So the question is, how does that correlate with the number, the difference between number of executed instruction, not just load and store, uh, okay. number of instruction. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying the, that- The uh, number of instructions are very highly correlated, extraordinarily highly correlated, like within less than a 10th of a percent difference. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And also like just, I think this is a detail that I forgot to mention is that like we are using NAS parallel, but we're just using one core to run uh, for now to to just get around like the issues of like not understanding these uh, dynamics that appear only in parallel execution. Um, okay, so uh, what we did after was we basically picked semi-random samples. So. Basically the two on the left, FT4 and FT127 are two samples from FT from NPB that show the least difference and the biggest difference between Gen5 and Real Hardware and the other ones are just random. So what I did was like, I took one of the probes in Gen5 and I configured it to just basically print all the commit uh, trace. Uh, and like I parsed that trace and I took all the load and store instructions and I correlated them to the PC. Uh, so what I show on the right here is a hypothetical situation where if like all the load and store instructions were one micro op, that would actually match what happens on real hardware. So basically the orange bars in the right plot are basically the extra micro ops that are uh, uh, used for like executing a certain in certain instructions that are mostly low. Actually, well, I think all of them are pair memory instructions. So that is LDP and STP in ARM, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, does that also make sense, Giacomo? So like the right plot is a hypothetical scenario mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where if you were to like get the translation of pair mem ops and just translate them to one micro op instead of like one, two or four, this is how the plot will look like. The, 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 blue, plot, the blue bars is what, how it, it'll look like. So yes, as Jason mentioned, we don't have direct evidence, but we have indirect evidence supporting our guess. So the next slide is, Again, we see that error in data cache access is explainable by, by, by that error in number of load and store instructions. And again, somewhat may be explainable. Uh, again, we narrowed it down to these pair mem ops uh, in Gen5. Uh, basically, like what is cool about the other research that we're doing is that like we get real workloads, but we get to focus on a small piece of it. And actually like we get to inspect all the instructions. So like, this is how we ran into it. We just found the PC that was ran the most, like that was the store instruction. We just found that PC in the object dump and it was like a pair of instructions. And then we went to the macro mem.cc in gen five. And I, like, this is how like the thought process worked. So, okay. So were you going to say something Giacomo? No, no. 
Okay. So my question is like, uh, what is your opinion basically? Like, uh, I mean, yes, one could argue that, well, we are simulating a different hardware and it's fine. And like, I, I don't think um, like um, this is like a general approach for modeling. Like we cannot like follow after every microarchitecture that is released based on ARM and like try to change the microcoding. But for the specific research that I'm doing right now is trying to understand how uh, or may, uh, we, we need to get this more accurate or explainable. So the question is why was this microcoded initially to like one, two or four? Like, is there a limitation in Ruby, Ruby sequencer that prevents us from just creating one micro op or is this just um, something that is like the default understanding. I, I just like, I don't have any ideas from like this point after. So I really appreciate any input. So um, I don't know specifically about the Ruby Ruby sequencer, um, but in general, when it comes to how an instruction is started to be uh, cracked into microbes, um, is something that um, I have not enough knowledge to actually address that. And as you are aware, like as, as you said, like it could be like a hardware dependent, and uh, um, I don't have visibility over that. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. but if we were to push a change, which undid this cracking, and instead had a single operation per paired memory operation, could that be accepted? Um, I guess we can have a discussion internally um, at ARM. And, uh, I want to. I mean, I also want to look a bit more into the into the issue. So, if you're willing to actually share the slides or whatever, um, because there are like a lot of graphs, and um, then we come back to you. Yeah, we can share these slides, or um, and we can also share. But all also, the like binaries and yeah. everything. Also, as far as I'm aware, um, in the decoder, in the ARM decoder you have some level of flexibility in how you decode something. Um, there is like something like decoder flavor, I believe. So I wonder whether you could uh, basically add like a different flavor that can be configured on how you actually do the cracking. Um, yeah, that... But you don't have to basically have like either one or, so you, you can choose between adding one or the other something to look into but yeah. i don't know about the ruby sequencer thing i'll say from my perspective looking at the code it looks like this was implemented as like the easiest way to get these instructions implemented and not necessarily thinking about what the hardware implications are and i think that we might just have stumbled across this modeling error um because if you look at these instructions they're accessing 64, 128, or 256 bits that are all aligned and, or they're, they're all sequential and aligned. And so there's no reason that it can't be a single access into the cache. Um, yeah. So so I think that it was just done because it was the easiest thing to do, um, but it's hard to know. Yeah, it, it could be. Yeah. Sounds okay. good. We'll, we'll, we'll post these. Um, if you could follow up, Giacomo, uh, I think there's a discussion. Yeah. Like and sorry, that. yeah, for sorry not for responding earlier. I was stressing about presenting this. Um, and yeah, I any other information that you need, we have multitudes of data and <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying to figure out this problem. And this is, um, you know, there's still other errors in the accuracy of Gen 5 for this system, but this is like the next biggest error. So we kind of want to yeah. get this one out of the way before we go on to the other um, yeah. errors that we're seeing. This is also like probably one of like the errors that needs a lot of expertise compared to like other things. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Mayor. Um, all right, so we only have like 30 seconds left, but does anybody else have anything they want to bring up?
Okay, great. Well, thanks for joining, um, especially um, if anybody was new joining. Uh, welcome to the Gym5 community. Um, and we will talk to you in approximately a month. We'll post on the discussions board when the next meeting is. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.